Hello and welcome to designing CG images with lighting. Uh, so this talk is all about using lights as a tool to create, hopefully, um, great looking images. Uh, I know there are like millions of tutorials out there teaching you everything about every single parameter on the light and render settings and whatnot, but that's not what this is about. Uh, so it, it doesn't matter what renderer you're using. It's completely software agnostic. It's really about, okay, taking lights and hopefully creating something that looks nice. And to do this, uh, this talk will kind of be two parts a little bit. Um, first, a little bit more technical. Uh, I kind of just want to touch base on a few technical important um, aspects, but then very quickly we will go more to the creative side and really um, experiment, uh, trying different things and seeing how uh, different choices can have a big impact on our lighting and um, uh, using certain tools to, 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 to make decisions on how to yeah, uh, create something that, that uh, is appealing. I think it's always good to have examples, right? <laughs> so um, I recently created this rendering. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that this is the best rendering in the world or anything, and by no means this is not like the gold standard or anything. It's really just, um, I guess, convenient because I have the scene, I have all the individual multi-lights as AUVs, so I can um, show you exactly what's going on, what my personal thought process was when I was doing this, mm. and just using this as a as a guideline, um, and we, we will really go through each and every light and see um, how it affects and contributes to the image. Um, but of course, we will also look at other stuff, right? So it's always important to look at references. Um, I looked at references before I started working on this. Um, so yeah, for sure, we will also look at other movies, paintings, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, uh, this, this YouTube video will be um, divided in chapters, so feel free to have a look what the individual chapters are, feel free to jump around. Um, I mean, of course, I'm trying to like make sense and have a narrative, but <laughs> uh, yeah, just so you are able to, um, to, to follow up. Yeah, I guess references is always something good to, um, to, to start to look at. So what I think is always useful is to look at um, classic art and paintings. Um, so to just to give you one example, uh, for example here, Albrecht Dürer, um, uh, he invented ray tracing in uh, 1538. <laughs> and yeah, it's, it's, it's always interesting to go back to these things and, and see um, everything we do today is not really that new in the end. <laughs> um, and for example, another famous dude, uh, Claude Monet, French painter, uh, modern art, uh, 1894. He painted the Cathedral series and um, it's pretty much the same object, um, just under different lighting conditions, different seasons. And if you have been ever asked to do wedge tests for lighting, um, you can thank uh, Claude Monet for that. This is basically wedge tests for lighting in 1894. <laughs> um, very interesting, I find. Uh, for this particular image, however, um, I, I always tend to look at uh, romanticism, um, romantic art. Uh, for example, what comes to mind is J.M.W. Turner. Um, it's like uh, from London, an English, English artist. Mm. And he often painted these really violent um, sea, ocean images. Uh, it's like, <laughs> you can, it's like, I call it the slave ship, this image. You can see like the chains to, uh, on the ankle of the person that they threw overboard because they were sick. Um, yeah, I guess, I mean, we have COVID, but uh, still better than this, eh? Um, but for example, this one, same artist, and uh, then we put this one next to it, right? So this is this is what I used as a reference. Um, so there are these old um, posters from the 90s from Lego, um, posters, advertisements in um, their catalogs and magazines. 
and I just wanted to create a modern version of it. So this is, of course, traditional like toy photography, real photography. And I wanted to do pretty much the same, but with CG. And it, it's almost scary how similar these two things look, right? So you have it, you have the same composition even. You have the foreground kind of the, doing this U shape in, in, in a warm tone. And then you have the, the yellow coming up on the left and then the blue here on the right and the sunset and everything. So, uh, it 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 doesn't matter what you're working on. I think there, there's there's references and and things throughout history that that can be really helpful. Um, yeah, so this is obviously one of my um, uh, one of the things that I um, got inspired by. Um, also, this one this is more like the actual poster format. You can see I just copied this not copied i took the same model like the cove here and put it there too and the ship um, just put it the other way around because i thought the stern looks really nice on this one um and but yeah same same kind of deal the yellow warm foreground and then the colder blue water background right um and then in terms of it's a bit more compositing um, related, but still it touches lighting. Um, from Caspar David Friedrich, German artist, uh, Wanderer Above the Sea Fog. Um, this is really interesting because um, it has, like, in terms of values, this is the image, right? So um, you have the really dark foreground, almost like a silhouette, like a cutout, and then the really bright background. We will talk more about values a bit later. Um, but uh, yeah, this is this is um, one of the best things you can find in terms of that. So um, you have this really. Um, f so you look, so look, look at, for example, at his hair and you look at this insane detail in his hair, like even though it's dark, uh, almost black, you see all the the fine granular detail, you can read his ear, um, the wrinkles and the clothing everything is there and the the stones as well and then the background is just super foggy and like big brush strokes really undefined and you know like of course this is not because he was lazy and you're just like oh yeah just do the background and be done with it no this is of course done on purpose right so <laughs> he purposely um uh didn't put all the all the definitions into the background that you would find, for example, in his hair, or even like this tiny plant here next to his feet. Um, and that really helps to um, create a nice separation between foreground and background uh, to really, uh, you can feel the distance, right, because of the values. And um, this can be very helpful for your decisions. So for example, if you zoom in here, you have lots of definition um, and clarity in his face, on his um, bicorn and his torso and everything. And then in the background, it just gets very muddy and foggy and you can't um, even tell exactly where the horizon line is. It just mushes together. And um, yeah, uh, th this is, this is kind of where I get my inspiration from. Um, yeah, so I mean, uh, you always say like, okay, you haven't seen art until you have seen it. <laughs> so uh, what that means is you should go to the museum and look at the actual thing because it will be completely different from what you see here on the screen. Especially Claude Monet, what we saw earlier with the cathedral, he painted or like, for example, the, um, the lily pad series that he did. It's like giant paintings, right? They're like five meters big. And then you, you stand right in front of it and you can't see anything. You, you, you're not able to tell what this is. And then um, you, you go back like 20 meters or something, and then it's still big because it's a five meter painting. And then suddenly when, when you step back, you, you see what this is act, what this actually is. Oh, it's a, it's a little lake or uh, like lily pads or whatever. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really interesting. It's um, kind of what this is, right? You, this could be anything. You don't know what it is. Then you zoom out and oh yeah it's an ocean sure <laughs> um yeah so i think i think that's interesting 
Now, a little bit more technical, um, but I try to do it. I try to do it very quickly. Um, talking about cameras, how how cameras work. Um, if you know this, uh, please feel free to skip it. I try to make it short, um, but just so we are all on the same page. Um, so a camera, right? You have the sensor, you have the um, shutter, and you have the the environment. And the environment, the light from it, bound, burns into the sensor. And that's how you create your, your image. And there are three parameters that you have on a camera to control how much of the light comes onto the film. And these three parameters are the, is the aperture, the shutter speed, and the ISO. The unit that you use for the exposure, so exposure, uh, exposure just means the brightness, so how much the environment is exposed to the film, right? So the shutter is closed, it opens, and so that's where the word exposure comes from. How much um, is the environment exposed to the, or the, what you, whatever you photograph, how much is that exposed to the film? And that's, that's the brightness. And the, the unit that we use is um, stops for that. And a stop is always um, doubling or halving. So if you go one stop up, you double the brightness. If you go one stop down, you cut the brightness in half and so on and so forth. Two stops up is double the brightness again. And yeah, the same for the other way, of course. And um, so for example, for the aperture, um, the numbers are a bit hard to calculate. That's just because the aperture is a circle. So you, you can't just double the circle and double the brightness. That's not how it works, right? Mathematically, so the numbers are a bit weird. But if you go, um, one step here, so for example, from four to, to eight, this is one stop. So if you change the aperture from one to the next, you have one stop, which means double the brightness or half the brightness. And the same goes for the shutter speed. So one, this is in fractions of seconds. And the shutter speed is um, how long the shutter is open and how long you can let light into the sensor. So um, of course, if it is open longer, then you're exposed more to light, and then you will have a brighter image. If it's just very short, then yeah, you will have um, less brightness. And the third parameter is the ISO. Um, the ISO is um, the sensitivity of the sensor. So uh, the more sensitive the sensor is, the brighter your, your image will be. And the nice thing is that this is all in correlation to each other. So let's say you have uh, one thirtieth of a second and an ISO of 200, and you have a certain uh, brightness. And then you decide, okay, I want to go with the ISO to 400 to here. So you have the more sensitive image, right? So the image will be brighter. Uh, so that means you can have the shutter open for half of the time, so one sixth instead, and that will result in the same image. Wrong. <laughs> it will. <in> <laughs> It will result in the same brightness, yes. Um, but um, th the thing is, um, when you change one of these parameters, um, the brightness will change, but you always have a trade-off. So the trade-off for the ISO, for example, is more sensitivity means more grain. So the higher this number is, the more grain you will get. Uh, the longer your shutter is open, of course, means you have more motion blur, more camera blur, right? Because everything is moving, your hand is moving with the camera. Um, so the longer it's open and it, and captures light, the more shaky it will be and you will get motion blur streaks. And then the aperture, how wide open the, the aperture is, um, will reduce, uh, will result in more depth of field. Or I should say, it, it's tricky because uh, in like if you ask a photographer, they use the term depth of field, the exact opposite of how we use it in CG. So for them, more depth of field is um, a sharper image, while when we say more depth of field, we, would, we usually mean it's, it, it will have more blur in the background, right? Um, so I, I will use it how CG people usually use it. Um, so more depth of field, more blurriness. Um, but yeah, so uh, aperture is wider open, we will get more cream, uh, more blur in the, um, in the image. And um, this is interesting to know. So because, um, for example, going back to our, to our rendering, 
we see okay this is um okay this is macro close-up photography because the minifigures are really small right so we have to go really close um and then usually you would expect a lot of um a lot of depth like a lot of uh, blur in the background a lot of depth of field in cg lingo um but you see it's pretty sharp until the very end where it kind of starts to um, get blurry and and that would mean in theory that if this would have been a real photo the aperture probably would have been very very small to um, to 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 have the uh, sharpness throughout the image and that means if we have if you want to have a well exposed image and a small aperture then that means and a small aperture like down to here, narrow aperture. That means that we have to have a very long shutter speed to um, make up for it, or uh, maybe a very long, a very high sensor sensitivity, a very high ISO. And this is uh, pretty much what I did. So uh, this image, this image has um, a lot of grain, um, probably more than you would usually see. Um, I mean, especially towards the corners where the um, the quality of the film usually is less uh, of the sensor that is less good. Um, so yeah, it's like just we can look at it and you can a second and it's better to see um, just yeah full of grain uh, because uh, yeah this is this is usually the, the limitations that you would expect from a from a real camera um, yeah. Now let's go to Nuke quickly. Um, so, so we talked about the the, the units stop, and um, I think this is a really good unit um, because. So I have um, I have my rendering here. Uh, we uh, go into this a bit more in a second. Um, here is the, uh, the just the moonlight. Uh, this is what the moonlight looks like. And um, I have the exposure node here and next to the grade node. And if we go with the exposure one stop up, so it stops, right? That means you would need to double our gain. So we put the gain to two. And that means if we flip between these two, it will look identical. Uh, so exposure to two and then the grade, we double it again. So we are at four and same image again. Uh, same goes for the opposite direction. Uh, so this is then minus one. So from zero is the default to minus one. Uh, this means the grade goes to 0.5, like we half it, um, same image. And then minus 2.25 and so on and so forth. And um, exposure is nice because um, it's it's a good it's a good thing to work with. Um, it's it's easy to to grasp what it what it does, because no matter it, it's it's relative, right? Because it doubles or halves. So no matter if your light is really bright or really dark or whatever the relation to other lights is, um, if you double or half it, you will make a difference. So that means you can say, okay, um, so this is my this is my final image, and I want to see. Um, uh, a stronger, a stronger, a stronger moonlight. So what you could try is we go up one stop, and then you see, oh yeah, okay, this makes this makes a difference. This makes a noticeable difference that is like worth talking about to um, discussing and seeing if this is maybe a better or worse image, right? Um, two two stops usually is oh yeah, okay, this is this is like a big difference, and then three stops is okay, this is like a drastic difference, and this. One, two, three rule kind of applies to whatever light you try this on. So we could just take this node and go to, for example, the ship, the ship lights. And so this is the default one. Oh yeah, this makes a difference, right? Uh, you can see more reflections on the water and stuff and on the island even. Uh, and, and three, it suddenly it becomes the main light source of the image. Um, and uh, the same is true for the other way around, like minus one, okay, it's less, uh, minus two, even less, and minus five usually means you turn it off. Um, oh, minus five, not five, eight. <laughs> so this is really good to work with. And it also means that if you go smaller than this, for example, you say half a stop. Okay, half, but what is half a stop doing? Yeah, okay, this is, this might still make a difference if you, if you are um, like, uh, if you have a strong opinion about this image and you 
this is maybe still worth discussing, but then you already start to notice, okay, a quarter of a stop. And let's be honest, nobody cares. Like if you look at the final result, if you post it on Facebook, whatever, big compression over it, nobody cares if it's a quarter stop, brighter or darker for whatever light here. So it's a good, it's a good tool because you know, if you go certain numbers, you know what to expect, you know um, what happens uh, or what might not happen. <laughs> So now that we are in Nuke, um, let's quickly quickly compare the final result, which is this, um, to the raw render. Uh, this is so. This is just the beauty, and I'm just overing or undering the um, the background, so it's a bit fair, more fair to compare it. Uh, so yeah, this just this one over note, and you see, oh, it's slow. I'm comparing this. Um, the, the final comp treatment that I did is not really doing anything besides what you usually would consider happening in a comp. So it adds the grain, of course, it adds the fog, it adds the depth of field, it adds um, a little bit of a contrast curve, the glow, um, all that stuff, but the lighting is not touched. So we don't touch the lighting anymore uh, going from the raw render to the final comp. Um, and yeah, I guess that's important. Um, and then now I here I, I have all the um, the different different multi lights, so we can go we can step through them. So this is what they all look like, um, and we will go through them uh, in more detail in a bit. Um, but uh, yeah, just important to see I guess uh, if we plus all these um, individual lights together, we get um, pretty much the beauty back. There's one difference because I think the beauty has clamped highlights. Um, but yeah, otherwise, otherwise it, the, the math works. Um, okay, great. Uh, so what do we start with? Let's start with the, with the moon. Uh, so the moon, the moon is this. Um, and and it's interesting, I think, because um, when I was doing this, I was thinking again, like, what color does the moon actually have? And um, so the moon, the moon is not really a light source, right? The moon is just uh, the, the sun. The sun is a light source. The moon is just a planet. And then um, then the, the sun is shining onto the moon and the moon is shining onto Earth. So if you will, if you would do it like completely physically accurate, your your moon would be your first GI bounce, your first indirect bounce, right? Because the moon itself is not a light source. Um, and what that means is that the color of the moon is the color of the sun multiplied by the surface color of the moon. And to prove this theory, I have this image. Uh, you can find it if you just go if you just go to Wikipedia and 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 search for moonlight, you find this image, and um, believe it or not, this is uh, taken by night. This is of course like insanely long exposure for thirty seconds. It even says here thirty seconds, and the only thing that gives it away that this is taken by night is that you can see the stars in the sky. Otherwise, nobody would be able to tell that this has been taken by night, um, which kind of shows, yeah, the, the, the moon is not too different from, it doesn't have different characteristics from what the sun would be doing. Like even the sharpness of the shadows is like similar, it's sharp and everything. So it's really interesting. And um, uh, well, now you look at my image and then you see, okay, what is this? This is like deep blue, but this is not what the image looked like, right? Okay, so uh, how I treated this is um, I treated it like toy photography. So you would imagine you're in a studio, you have your camera on a tripod, you have your lights set up, and then you move your lights around until you have a pretty image, you take the photo. So the moon obviously wouldn't be the real moon, it would be a studio light that resembles the moon. And that means the studio light can be whatever I want it to be. <laughs> and of course, it's not arbitrarily blue. Um, 
so I mean, you often see it, right? You often, um, if you look at um, like movies done by night or anything or something, um, it would be blue or paintings. Also, you can see the same. Um, and uh, the, the the reason, or be, often when we think about the night, blue comes to mind as a color. But why is that? So the the there are multiple things. So first of all, our eyes. Um, are more sensitive in that color spectrum. So if it's really dark, um, then everything we see is actually looking a bit more blue to us uh, because this is where we are, we are more sensitive for dark values. Um, so that's one thing. But I think it's also that um, light is always, a, or colors, more, I would say colors are always a bit relative, right? It's always in comparison to another color that we see. So, for example, if you go outside in the city and you have all these street lights that are all deep saturated yellow or from um, buildings from the, through the windows, you see yellow lights and then um, you have the moon. And then, of course, the moon, by comparison, compared to the street lights and building lights and whatnot, the moon will look a bit bluer because it's not as yellow as all the other lights are. Um, so I think that's that's kind of where it comes from. Um, and I, so yeah, of course it's not, it, I, I didn't just arbitrarily made it blue. It's kind of like, okay, this is um, based kind of on the perception, how we perceive the moon uh, to be blue and then bending reality a bit. And then, yeah, you end up with blue. Um, but also, also that I, I knew, um, of course, when I was planning this, looking at references and stuff, I, I knew that I wanted to have um, a lot of warm lights. I wanted to have the warm torch. I wanted to have the chest, which is warm. I wanted to have this cove with the warm lighting in it. The ship has warm lights. So it was kind of natural to um, have the moon as a contrast to that, right? So when you want to have something warm, you need a contrast to that so that it appears warm. And in order to make it appear warm, uh, yeah, I took the blue cold moon so that it yeah, creates the contrast. One tiny technical aspect, um, I have the scene open here actually, I promised I would show it. <laughs> so this is the scene, uh, this is the little <laughs> section where they are standing on, little platform, and then um, the rest of the island, the ocean, the ship. And here we see our moon. So it is a directional light. Um, uh, just because I think it, it's it's easy to control, right? You just put it somewhere and then you just move it a bit until you find um, find something that looks nice. So uh, for me, for what this is doing, it it catches all these um, palm leaves and um, the it, it rims no not rims it kicks onto the onto the island here and um, well, it kind of rims the island in the foreground. Uh, and all the leaves here, um, yeah. So it's like contre jour um, uh, type type of type of deal, and then uh, we have this um, highlight here, that long line on the ocean. Uh, so again, if we look at some stuff from Caspar David Friedrich, uh, we like this guy. So yeah, you can see the. I guess yeah, this is supposed to be the the uh, the moon rise. And you can see the the sprinkles here on the on the ocean where the moon is, just of course not yellow as in his, but blue instead. <laughs> Another option instead of the um, direction light, um, again I just chose it because it, it's easy to control. Um, another option would be a um, area light, disk light for example, um, and then you would put it really 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 far away. Um, I mean the direction light has an um, infinite distance distance um, the um, I mean the real moon of course is not infinitely far away it has a set distance um, and uh, so you would put your area light really far away the advantage of it is it it is a bit harder to control right because of, you have to put it far away and everything you have to um, but the advantage is that you could for example map a texture onto it um, in, in this case it didn't really it wouldn't have really made a difference because the, the surface is really broken up already. Um, I think a textured light really wouldn't have made a, a big difference. 
But for example, imagine you have a simple flat wall of bricks or a, a mirror or something where you can clearly see the, the light source. Then of course, a directional light wouldn't be good enough and you would, you would want to use um, an area light instead where you can put a, the moon onto it um, and then you would see the actual like the surface of the moon onto the in, in the reflection um, yeah. so this is kind of like the choices you have either you go for the slightly more simple road route and then you have to figure out if it would be worth to go um, yeah to take the extra effort um, okay then of course what goes hand in hand with um, the with the, the the moon is the dome so the dome it really acts just as a um big surrounding ambient fill light yeah um, it really helps to just fill in the blacks everywhere um, reach all the areas that the moon for example doesn't reach for example this is um, pitch black and then uh, with the moon uh, with the dome we kind of get into those those areas that are a bit dark otherwise and um, <clears throat> um, the important thing here is that it has the same um, orientation as your as your moon so ideally you would parent it to the same locator or parent them to itself or something um, to make sure that it's um, physically plausible in a way so because if you look at the raw um, HDR that I used. Oh, wrong color space. So when we look at the, at the at the HDR that I used for this, um, you see okay there are some bright values around the sun. So for example here we have like uh, two point two point seven something three, and then it gets hotter and hotter, and then in here it's like. <laughs> 11k uh, 12k um, so of course you want to paint this out so it doesn't double up with your uh, moon that we place manually uh, so you can see my bad painting job here um, but you want to leave the rest um, untouched so you still get the nice fall of the, the dynamic range from the HDRI um, and then yeah of course you have to make sure I think let me uh, let me view the lights yeah um, oh my god, this is... Uh, my GPU doesn't like this. Um, <laughs> yeah, you can see that the um, dome is roughly ori oriented the same way as the as the moon is, um, so that you have the correct uh, falloff. And then looking at the dome, yeah, you can see that uh, the hot falloff that we had um, from, from where the sun was is uh, kind of where the moon now now it's positioned. Um, I can even see it here on the on his head. Uh, adding adding these two lights together, um, I think we can almost go step by step. Let's disable all of these and um, look at the results. So this is then dome and moon combined. And um, the next thing I think it's interesting is the torch. Um, so this is, of course, the big light in the foreground. And um, it already shows what the Im image will be in the end. It will be um, separated kind of in the foreground, which is warm and red, and the background, which is uh, deep blue. So this is the, the color contrast that I was going for, um, warm and blue. and. Um, things that are um, interesting to see here for example George de la Tour um, French uh, French painter and this is only lit by the um, torchlight so this is this chiaroscuro style um, uh, painting where you have um, chiaroscuro they, they use these um, black holes to to give volume to to bodies for example and it's really um impactful and um, if you look at the torchlight by itself this is uh, pretty much what it's what it's doing so you um, leave shapes completely in darkness um, to to shape them um, so uh, this is what this what this torch is doing um, and yeah it's a very very contrasty look um, and makes it um, i wouldn't say spooky <laughs> 
but um, yeah. The next thing um, are practical lights. So practical light, I mean, the torch is already a practical light, right? Practical lights is, um, are the lights that we see in the image. Um, opposed to film lights that are outside of the of the of the image and to quote Roger Deakins here uh, I find myself lighting more and more with practical light sources and very few film lights choice of and the placement of practical light sources is an increasingly important aspect of lighting digital capture and the increased dynamic range that it offers makes lighting this way even more exciting quote end um, yeah, and I, I agree. It's it's a great um, a great way of, of lighting your shot. Um, so what always comes to mind for me is from uh, Daredevil. Um, even if you're not into super, I'm not into superheroes. Um, but if you have Netflix, um, maybe check it out. Uh, they have insane. It it it's really gorgeous. Like uh, in, in this bar, for example, they have uh, multiple scenes in this bar like all these practical lights and see how it guides your eye through this like how the how this string of light cuts through the heads of the actors and then it frames them here again and then here it's just like arbitrary colors yellow blue red green all just there and just creating this really colorful image and it makes it look really rich and um yeah i, I love this it's it's amazing um so this is something I, I wanted to have. I wanted to have practical lights. And so I think it's, it's always important to, um, to, to work with what you have, to embrace it. And for example, of course, the, the ship was, um, was natural because there are actual lights on the ship of the model. So I just put light bulbs into like, so, I mean, again, toy photography, Lego really doesn't doesn't really do that um, to put um, lights um, inside their bricks, but technically it would be possible, right? So the bricks inside are hollow, so you can put tiny LEDs, and there are even like Chinese brands that um, sell light kits for official Lego sets. Um, so you you could, um, yeah, I even did that for one of for one of one of the sets I have, and you just put these tiny LEDs inside the bricks and the bricks are transparent, so it illuminates. So this is something, again, that would be possible if you would do a, a, re a real photo. And um, yeah, so in the in the actual lights, but then also inside the stern, so it uh, light comes out of there and um, there from the bottom and the bow. And um, yeah, it it just makes the image more rich, more interesting. Same goes for the cove. Um, the cove doesn't have um, light Lego models on it, um, but I just took the <laughs> um, the uh, the mask and put a light inside there, and then I hid two light sources just behind the temple and behind the mountain there. So it could be like torches that they put up um, the islanders. And um, yeah, then the next thing is of course the chest so <laughs> this doesn't really make sense i mean there's of course th there wouldn't be a light inside the chest especially not if it has been uh, buried for how many years uh this is kind of just um you know the the typical thing that you see in movies uh, what comes to mind for example here is um the ark of covenant and yana jones it opens up and then the the uh, all their faces are melting right when the, the light comes out um, so that's what this is um, yeah and it's just kind of cool how it shines onto his onto his body and on, onto his chin um, and by now you can already see what I was going for when I was so I spent some time of course um, realigning all the, the the ship and the cove and where it is and in relation to the um, in relation to the characters. <clears throat> so you can kind of see um, the Fibonacci spiral that it, uh, that, it, that we have here. So uh, if you just go from the light sources 
it, it kind of goes from here to there to there to there to there. Um, roughly. <laughs> and that was kind of what I was trying to do when I was aligning all these different elements to, to, to get the composition. Um, actually, let's put our background behind here when we look at this. I think this is a... Um, it makes more sense to look at it this way because this is what it will be, of course, in the end. Um, okay, so uh, we are in a good spot, but um, now, uh, for, for now, we did um, a lot of things that are obvious, right? So we have our our um, our torch, we have our important objects that we lit with practical lights. So this is all the natural lights, dome and moon, and then the, the practical light that we see in, in the shot. So now what we um, have to have to look at is um, if this is a good image, is, is this a good, um, is this good lighting? And um, uh, partially, partially yes, partially no. Um, so a good technique that you can always do with everything is just turn it into black and white, you press Y and nuke, and then you zoom out. And um, there are certain things that um, work and certain things that don't work. So for example, um, the leaves in the foreground are um, pretty dark, and this is good because we want to have this layering, right? We want to have the leaves in the foreground, then that are dark, kind of acting like silhouette cutout. Then the main actors, the characters, um, and then and then the background. Another little image here. Uh, again, Caspar David Friedrich. Um, you see the foreground, the almost black, not that, but dark values, um, silhouetting, kind of framing the image, the vegetation, um, and then this one thing like hanging in the middle. Uh, try to do this a little bit too, so it's like on the outside and then there's one thing that kind of pokes in a little bit more. Um, yeah, so this is um, uh, what I thought of. Um, and uh, then then what, what doesn't really work that well is uh, the separation between the midground and the background. Um, so especially if you zoom out like this and then you put your cursor over his head to hide it, um, his 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 torso melts completely into the ocean. Like if you if you if this is the first time you see this, you wouldn't even see that the red beard the minifigure is there, right? You wouldn't you wouldn't be able to tell. It's just you could you would just think that the ocean continues there to the right. Um, so what we have to do is we have to put up lights to, to fix that. And um, I always, I always um, try to do it in a natural way. Um, so <laughs> I am not a fan of light linking or any sort of cheating or anything like that because, you know, it, it just makes your life complicated. You just make your own life complicated because you start to put a light there and just put it on red beard you light link it to him and then you know at some point the shaders start to behave weird if they would if they were done uh, in the physically correct way and then you try to balance it out with another light and then it looks even weirder and then you start to tweak the shader to make up for your cheated lights and you just get into this uh, negative like spiral loophole that doesn't take you anywhere. Um, spend five more minutes and try to find a natural position for your light to achieve what you want to do. And there are a lot of ways you can do that. Um, so for example, if you want to um, have a light that focuses a bit more on Redbeard or on Will on the other side, um, you can put barn doors on your lights, right? So. Um, because this is what I actually was struggling with quite a bit. I wanted to um, put more warm lights in the foreground. Uh, because especially here, if you look at this, it looks a bit um, dirty almost. Yeah, you have the, the, the strong green, which is um, the, the bounce from the moon, actually. 
um, if you hide this, you see it like the moon shines onto the green leaves and it bounces back onto him. This is where it comes from. So it's correct and it's it's good that it is this way, but it, it still results in a, in, a, in a dirty looking image. So um, what we can do is we can put up more yellow lights to kind of fix the, the dirtiness and also to help him um, because he he's naturally very dark, right? He, the, the, the plastic bricks are black. So this is what it is. We can't do anything about that really. So all we can do is put up lights, um, warm lights preferably. Uh, here we also have this green, it's not super nice, um, to counterbalance this. And uh, one, one main issue I had with that is if we look at the actual uh, scene, so you can easier see what I mean. Um, the the leaves here are really really close to the characters. They're like this, they're right next to them. So whenever you put up a light, you would always light the the leaves as well. But we want to keep the leaves dark, right? We don't want them to get brighter because we want to use them as a silhouette. So you can see already what I did here. I put up these blockers. Um, they have a much darker material. It's just not represented correctly in the viewport. Um, and they are, so this is what you also could do in a real, in your studio. If you toy photo, if you do the photography for this, you just put up black cards um, everywhere, really close to the, to the, to the plants uh, to prevent this from happening. So this um, helped me to block off all the bouncing uh, from the moon and the dome and um, everything because of course the moon is um, illuminating 360 so it was also a bit brighter before and the putting up the blockers helped to um, make the leaves not as bright but especially also for um, the warm lights that i want to put there to to get some more um, separation and more warm light in the in the background uh, in the foreground and uh, this is what they look like so it's two lights. It's one coming from the from the right, and then one coming from the left. Uh, you can see here, it's the two big um, red rectangles here, or squares. Um, and yeah, uh, there's this blocker right above here, and there's the blocker right here to kind of um, yeah guide the light where I want it to be. And also it has. Um, can't see it in the viewport, unfortunately, but it has um, uh, tight barn doors, um, so it um, really focuses on what I wanted to focus on. And um, it's it's kind of acting as an extension to the torchlight, because um, if we look at it for a second, um, of course, what comes to mind is okay. Yeah, we can uh, just um, expose up the torch, right? Let's see what 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 happens if we go up um, a stop or two. Uh, oh, for some reason, this defaults to densities. Why? Uh, okay, one one stop, two stops, and it, it it doesn't really do what we want it to do. So first of all, the the leaves get super bright, so it's not really a good idea. But then also the the faces start to burn out, <clears throat> and yeah, it's it's not super pleasing. Um, so yeah, this is not really an option. Um, unfortunately, so this is almost the, the torch. How it is is as bright as it as it can be um, before looking um, weird. So yeah, the the fill lights left and right was kind of the 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 second natural thing. Um, you can see uh, without them, you you already have this warm here from the from the from the flame, and then it kind of just adds and enhances what is kind of already there anyways and then yeah you notice all the dirty the dirty look the green disappears because of that and yeah here too same deal and it, it really helps to um, just separate this island from the ocean so this is kind of like green blue and then now it's yellow blue it's couldn't be it's couldn't be clearer than this um, so of course the highlights don't always make sense like this highlight here of course possibly couldn't come from this torch it's obviously or here this highlight here it obviously comes from here but you don't really you don't really um, 
it, it's a tr let's say it's a trade-off I was willing to make um, to enhance my separation to make the image easier to read to make it easy um, to digest and for example if you look here um, this is this merges together right if you sample the value here uh, 001 sample the value here 001 it's almost identical like this is the same same value uh, it's easier to see in black and white and then we turn on <clears throat> our fill lights and boom there we go so this is still of course 001 and then here oh 0026 it, it doubled um, so yeah this is this really helps um, help to 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 get the separation there um, Okay, this is great now, um, but um, I think there's still more we can do. If we look at if we look at um, uh, Redbeard or Will too, they look a bit um, dead. <laughs> I mean, it's it's it, they are toys, so they are not alive. Um, but what can we do with lighting to make them look alive? Uh, so this is kind of the challenge, right? And um, and of course, it's always nice to think about natural ways, ideally. And um, for example, one thing that bothered me a little bit is that we have all this um, blue in the background. And um, there's only this blue on his head, and that's pretty much it. Then you don't find it anywhere else in the image. So, it, it, oh yeah, on the, on the chest a little bit, okay. But otherwise it kind of disconnects um, itself a little bit from the background. And I mean, uh, this is what we <laughs> tried to achieve earlier to get the separation, but um, you don't at the same time want to make it look artificial, right? You still want to have, you want to feel the connection. So um, one thing that you could do is, for example, um, creating blue, uh, additional kickers, fill lights, ish, um, to uh, connect foreground and background um, and bring your characters to life. And let's take a look uh, before, after. Um, yeah, now he, now you can, you can read the smile. You can, the, the, the eye is almost shining because he looks at the gold and he's excited. Um, and this is all done through lighting. So we, we tell we tell the story um, of him finding the treasure and being excited about that with the help of lighting. Um, and same goes for him. Like he um, did all the hard work with his shovel, right? So now he, this is the the reward that he gets for it. Um, and yeah, you can see the you can see his big smile um, too. Uh, yeah, it it, it also helps. Um, uh, to go for a second a little bit into shading. So not no two Lego bricks are the same in terms of the material, the quality. Um, for example, if you take a minifigure and you hold it under a... I do this all the time. I spend probably an hour every day rotating Lego bricks under my desk lamp here <laughs> and um, inspecting how, how the material looks and how it behaves and uh, what it is. And you see that, for example, the, the, the faces have are really smooth. They are really, really smooth. Um, you, you see strong, sharp reflections in it, like almost like a, yeah, like a mirror. Um, and then you look at, for example, his, uh, the, the bicorn or like helmets, wigs in general from Lego, they are way, um, way rougher. You can, you can see the bump map, uh, you can see uh, the spider webbing um, way more. And the same goes for torsos and hands. They are, you can even feel it when you scratch over it with your fingernail um, or with your finger just. Uh, the, 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 especially the hand is really rough. You can, it, it's like, it makes a different sound compared to when you scratch over the head. Uh, the head, I mean. Um, and uh, the, the lights, the lights help to, to, um, to, to sell this difference. Like you can have the best look diff in the world. If the light doesn't support it, then you won't see the, the look diff work. And um, this is what uh, I hope, um, yeah, shows it a bit more, the different qualities of each and every brick. Um, so for example, also these 
uh, these little one by one um, um, round studs are way smoother um, compared to his compared to his hand, for example, or his 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 arm. Um, and now let's compare this again. So we go to black and white. We take all these slides that we added now and we see and we can have a look if it got better and yeah i think it does uh, so will for example separates it's himself way better from the island like now we can see oh yeah there's a person and the same goes for redbeard so if we hide the head again <laughs> like this so the torso looks like the ocean red and now the torso I mean, we still can't read it. It's him. It's too small. But now the torso more could could be could be another chest treasure, right? It looks more like the gold coins uh, in the treasure in terms of values. I mean, and this is a good thing because he is next to the treasure, so the values should be similar. It should be in the same world, and it shouldn't be like him kind of drifting into the background where he doesn't belong to. Um, and yeah, we can definitely see uh, how he now the, the torch also um, kind of stands out more from the from the ocean, um, and the island itself has a way better separation. Um, so I think we are pretty much done. Um, a last thing um, we, we we can try is to put up a rim light. Uh, and <laughs> I usually don't like putting up rim lights just for the sake of putting up rim lights, right? Just arbitrarily, oh yeah, let's put a rim light. No, um, the, the, the rim light, uh, so we have contre jour, right? So the, the moon is in front of us or above us. Um, so it, it makes sense to have a rim light. Um, this, this, this calls for it. Um, and uh, this is what the rim light looks like. Um, and Again, it's just a natural extension of the moon that we have, so it explains itself, and um, it it does two things in this in, in in this case. It it separates insanely from the background, like this is this helps tremendously to separate it. Uh, taking a closer look, it, at the same time, it also connects uh, the, the the hot highlights that we see on the island with the with the characters. Um, but at the same time, it, if we, it's also important if we look at these details, like these minor things, like these minor additions to the image. Um, if we start to go that far, that we don't <clears throat> destroy anymore what we set up earlier, right? We wanted to have. Separation, foreground, background, warm versus cold, uh, sharp versus undefined. This is what we wanted to do. So, um, if we if we do these minor adjustments and tweaks, I think it's important to always check back that we don't hurt our overall image anymore. And uh, so, if if we now toggle back and forth the rim light. Yeah, it doesn't really do anything, right? If it's there or not, it doesn't make a difference. And in, in this case, it's a good thing. Uh, we, we don't want to destroy our image anymore. We want to um, keep it as it is. But if we zoom in close, yeah, it's, it, it, it helps to um, uh, do what we discussed that we want it to be. Um, yeah. And then uh, all that is left to do is to do the compositing. Um, I mean, this is not about compositing, so I won't talk about it too much. Yeah, I hope you liked it. I hope uh, it was uh, useful. Maybe you learned something, maybe not. Um, let me know what you think. I would be interested um, if you, if something maybe, I don't know, I hope everything was clear that I said, if something doesn't make sense, or if you disagree with something, uh, feel free to um, let me know in the comments, uh, shoot me a message. Um, yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, for, for, for being here and yeah. <laughs>